Welcome to 5-Minute Physics. Uh, today I want to talk about how to weigh the galaxy and ultimately the first discovery of dark matter. And I thought I'd work through it in detail. I've talked about it many times and I've written books about it, but I thought I'd, uh, I'd do it here for, uh, for some of you to see where, how you can literally um, understand and calculate the abundance of dark matter in our galaxy. Um, the story begins with um, Tycho Brahe uh, and, and, and Kepler in the uh, early part of this, uh, what was the the seventeenth uh, uh, century, and um, Kepler had discovered a supernova and had been given an island and uh, by the emperor of Denmark then, and had uh, studied for literally twenty years the positions of the planets in the sky. That's all he did, as well as as doing crazy things on the island. He then got expelled from the island and and moved to Prague, where he got an assistant, Johannes Kepler, who. Uh, he assigned the task of analyzing that data. And Kepler spent 20 years analyzing the data and came up with rules which r laid the, f the foundation of really almost all of modern physics. He gave the material that led, uh, led, that led Newton to his, his universal theory of gravity, as I'll show you. And um, he discovered that um, not only that the, plan the orbits of the planets were, uh, were around the sun, but weren't quite circles, but, but were, were very close in ellipses, but he, um, he discovered a, a bunch of other rules, which can be written in a lot of different ways. But really, the, the main rule, which we now understand, is he discovered that if you plot, as a function of their distance from the sun, the square of the velocity of planets around the sun, the planets fall on a beautiful curve. In fact, if you actually take the data out of an under undergraduate astronomy textbook, you'll find that they fit the curve unbelievably well, it almost looks like uh, it was fixed. Um, they find that the velocity squared of the planets around the sun goes as one over their distance from the sun. That is a central component of Kepler's laws, a planetary motion, distilled in one single equation. And um, so, and but this fact that the velocity squared of planets went around the sun, sun as going around the sun went down as one over r, gave Newton the fodder to develop his universal theory of gravity, because of course Newton before that had developed his first law of motion, f equals m a. These are vector quantities. The force is mass times acceleration, and that means that that a force produces a change in velocity, which is acceleration. Now the thing about it is, for let's let's just approximate the planets as going in circles around the sun, or the moon going in a circle around the Earth. If they're going in a circle, they're going at a constant speed. If they're orbiting a circle, they're going at a constant speed. The speed doesn't change. But the accelerate there is acceleration because while the speed doesn't change, the direction of the velocity changes. And as some of you may have learned in, in high school, the way to, you can find out the difference of two vectors is basically to take the two vectors and more or less put them at the same point and ask what this vector here is the difference between them. Now, if you think about it, if this is V1 here and V2, they're the same magnitude but different direction, we can ask how much are they changing as an orbit goes around the uh, around the, the Earth or the Sun? And the answer is, clearly, if the, if the speed was twice as big, then the difference would be twice as big. So the acceleration is going to be proportional to the velocity, but also, look at it. If the speed is, is, is bigger, then it's going to go around the circle more in the same time. If the speed was bigger, in the same time, it would end up over here. So it would change even more. So, in fact, there's another... There's another proportionality of velocity, so the acceleration goes as velocity squared. But if the circle, if the orbit was much smaller, then with the same size velocities, once again, it would go a lot further around. So the acceleration goes like v times v over r, because it goes as 1 over r. If the circle's smaller, the, the velocity changes more. If the circle's bigger, the direction of the velocity changes less. And so the acceleration, which Newton des described for something in a circle, goes as v squared over r. And that's all he needed. Because he said if the planets are going around the sun, 
there must be some force that are, that's making them orbit the sun. And he said, well, we can calculate the magnitude of that force. The force is equal to mass times acceleration. But the acceleration is like v squared over r. So that's m v squared over r. But now Kepler tells him that v squared goes like 1 over r. So that means that this goes like m over r squared. So this told Newton that I could explain that he could explain the the uh, velocity behavior that Kepler discovered if there was a force pulling planets towards the sun that went down as one over the square of the distance from the sun. Now he'd also shown that if I, that 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 uh, for every force there's an equal opposite reaction force. If I pull you, you're pulling me. At, and therefore, if the mass of the of the planet was here, the mass of the sun must be here. So that so that the the force so the if the sun is pulling the planet, the planet is pulling, pulling the sun with the same force. And then there was some coupling constant. There was some constant of proportionality, which we now call G for, for, uh, for gravity. And, it's, and, and it describes the, um, the magnitude of, of the gravitational force. This is Newton's universal law of gravity, which he was able to derive simply because he applied Kepler's law. Now... Not only does this explain why v squared goes like 1 over r, but it allows us to calculate what v squared is. Because let me cancel the masses here. The mass of the object isn't, isn't, doesn't matter. 1 r cancels that r. And you get for an object orbiting the sun, the square of the velocity goes like g m over r. So there's the, proportion, there's the 1 over r, and this is the constant of proportionality. But as you see, this allows you to weigh the sun. Because all you have to do is measure the velocities of the planets and know their distance from the sun, and if you know the strength of gravity, you know the mass of the sun. And by fitting this curve up here, unbelievably accurately, because the curve is, it go, follows this law to better than one part in a million, one can derive that the mass of the sun is something like 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. And that's the way we measure the mass of the sun. And it's also the way we measure the mass of the Earth. We can measure the mass of the Earth, and you can go out tonight and do it by um, knowing that the moon goes around the Earth, knowing the distance of the moon, and working out its speed, because you know it takes 29 days to go around the Earth at a certain distance, so you can work out its speed. And tonight you can weigh, or this afternoon, or right now after this, you can weigh the Earth. Okay. Now, we apply this and to weighing our galaxy. Our galaxy is a spiral galaxy. Edge on, it looks like that. With a, with a bulge at the center, and we're, at, we're somewhere near the edge. If you look at it from top down, it looks like a spiral galaxy, so it kind of looks like this. And we're also at the edge. Now, the interesting thing is, the sun is about, oh, th something like 30,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. And the sun goes around the galaxy once every 200 million years. <coughs> at a velocity of about 200 kilometers per second. Now, this is, so we, we, we have the sun orbiting the galaxy, and applying Newton's laws, we can just, we can calculate the total mass pulling the sun in, because this gives you the velocity, this gives you its distance from the center, and applying the two together, you can actually work out the total mass of material pulling the uh, sun around the galaxy. And when you work it out, it's around 10 to the 11th times the mass of the sun. 100 billion times the mass of the sun. And that works out beautifully because, in fact, the number of stars, more or less like our sun, which is almost an average star, um, uh, in our galaxy is more or less 100 billion. There are 100 billion suns, if you wish, or 100 billion stars in our galaxy. So it works out. But what observers did, and... and um, uh, um, uh, starting in the 1970s, was, was uh, uh, estimate, uh, was measure objects that are further out, hydrogen gas clouds, and uh, uh, in particular, one of the observers who did this it, it was a wonderful woman named Vera Rubin, who, um, who actually wasn't allowed to get into Princeton Graduate School in astrophysics because she, they didn't accept women at that time, and she, she went to night school and, and became, and anyway, became a very important astronomer, and was nominated, I know, for the Nobel Prize for her discovery because what she discovered, along with other colleagues, 
was if you look at other objects further out from the sun, you would expect to see this fall off because the galaxy, the sun is at the edge of the galaxy, so you'd expect to see this fall off, this v squared going like 1 over r, or v going like 1 over the square root of r, fall off, and use these objects to better measure the mass of our galaxy. But what Vera Rubin and others discovered when they looked at gas clouds, globular clusters, and satellite galaxies like the, like the Large Magellanic Clouds and other things, when they measured their velocity around the galaxy, instead of falling off, the velocity remained constant. Now how could that be? Because it should fall off as 1 over r, v squared should fall off as 1 over r, if, uh, if all the mass of the galaxy was contained in this region, instead v, instead v was going like a constant or v squared was going like a constant. Well, the only way that could be, the only way this quantity could remain a constant is if m goes like r. So the mass of our galaxy increases like r out to distances 10 times as far away as the Earth is, uh, or the Sun is going around our galaxy. But since all the visible mass is in here, this implies that there's 10 times as much mass in a halo around our galaxy, and this was the first indication in the 1970s of dark matter. It's since been verified in basically every spiral galaxy and other galaxies we've seen using these same techniques, measuring this either for a spiral galaxy or the average velocity, which yesterday I told you was the virial velocity was, was, was also basically around the same number, um, that you can measure this, and in every, more or less every galaxy we see, we see the same thing. Instead of the velocity falling off where the visible material is, it continues out. And those are the first evidence that, that at least 10 times as much mass uh, exists in our galaxy as can be accounted for by stars. Now, there's hot gas and there's other things. that So we know at least five times as much mass is in the galaxy as accounted by all the kind of normal matter we know of the first example of dark matter, and, and, and we're looking for that dark matter in our galaxy. There are other ways to measure dark matter, cosmologically, and maybe in a future lecture I'll talk about that. But this established, and it was controversial for a long time, but for, was the first evidence that basically convinced people that the dominant amount of material in our universe is made of something other than you and I, dark matter. And you can get it just by using Newton's laws and weighing our galaxy, just like you weigh the sun and the earth. Okay, talk to you tomorrow.